Hello, everyone. My name is Haley Cassidy, AmeriChem's Global Branding and Digital Marketing Leader. I'd like to thank you all for joining today's webinar, Color and Appearance Retention in Engineered Compounds Part 2, Healthcare. Polymers can degrade due to environmental stress agents such as oxygen, moisture, heat, and UV light over time. They can also develop cracking, crazing, staining, and discoloration from the constant use of hospital-grade disinfectants. Today we'll be teaching you how engineered compounds with specialized additives can mitigate these major healthcare environmental stresses. We'll even be sharing real case studies that exhibit before and after results in a range of end applications from hospital equipment to healthcare beds to patient monitors. All attendees are muted, so please send in your questions to the questions tab, and we'll be addressing them at the end of the presentation during our Q&A segment. Today, we'll start with a brief introduction of our panelists and who AmeriChem is, then jump into a discussion about the benefits of color and appearance retention for clinicians and patients. We'll talk about the effects of chemical and UV on healthcare compounds and how to better resist these environmental stressors through developing the optimum mechanical and aesthetic material performance. Lastly, we'll break down real life case studies and answer your live questions that you send in. Today, I am joined by Bill Urban, AmeriChem Engineered Compounds Senior Medical Manager, and Rafael Delgado, AmeriChem Engineered Compounds Senior Healthcare Application Engineer. I'll now turn it over to our panelists for them to give brief bios of themselves, followed by the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Haley. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome, everyone. Uh, and thanks, Haley, for uh, organizing and promoting this webinar series. Uh, I'm Bill Urban. I'm a member of the commercial team responsible for the market strategies for, for medical. Um, I'm actually new with AEC, and uh, my background is I'm an engineer turned marketeer. I actually came up as a biomedical engineer in, in a level one trauma center right out of uh, in a city hospital right out of school. So I know my way around a, a hospital, uh, how and why devices fail uh, from a material perspective and otherwise, and, and what's uh, important to uh, clinicians and uh, patients. Um, my experience includes uh, global product management, marketing, business development in plastics for medical, diagnostic imaging, infection prevention, and uh, clinical safety. Uh, my experience spans hospitals, research agencies, uh, biomaterial companies, and uh, FDA regulated OEMs. Um, I'm most passionate professionally about uh, bleeding edge technology, device safety and efficacy. And uh, I'm pleased to be joined by my technical colleague, Rafael Delgado, uh, who will introduce himself now, Raf. Hey, thanks a lot, Bill. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Rafael Delgado. Um, I hope this message finds you in good spirits and health. Uh, I started my passion in plastics as son of a tool and die maker. I quickly le learned that I didn't have the patience to go down that road. I couldn't even make an M gauge. Um, and uh, after my plastics degree, I went to work for LMPG at the time where I was working on specialty compounds. Then later transferring to Millicron, getting out of engineering and sales, selling machinery, auxiliary equipment, automation on the West Coast. Uh, I was then fortunate enough to connect with some LMP alumni, gave me the ability to go back into compounds to manage the Western region and been with American now for 12 years. In my current role, I help uh, our large medical device OEMs and our advanced healthcare OEMs with material selection um, and overall troubleshooting from part design to production uh, with injection molding assistance and processing assistance. So that's a little bit about me. Bill's are now gonna discuss and provide a snapshot of our overall business. Thanks, Raf. So uh, we're your global collaborative partner in Polymer Solutions. We're actually just coming up on our uh, 80th anniversary, and we, uh, AEC, American Engineered Compounds, are spread across 12 locations throughout the globe. Our global footprint spans North America, Western Europe, and Asia, and we're proud to boast uh, over 900 employees with diverse and uh, amazing uh, expertise in, in technology, material selection, uh, commercial expertise, 
and we're recognized as the global leader in the plastics industry. Uh, and to, to showcase further our uh, dedication to the healthcare market, I'd like to show you this graphic, which shows our significant technology, healthcare technology subsegments. This is uh, most, but not all, of our um, specialties in, in the healthcare segment. And as Raf will show you in more detail, we excel in developing medical formulations for uh, device applications. Uh, these mostly include applications for outside the body, although through a recent strategic uh, acquisition, we're spreading our portfolio to include more in vivo applications and also more specialized products such as uh, hearing aids, um, uh, urinary catheters, et cetera, as we uh, go outside the four walls of healthcare. So as your trusted collaborative advisor, I'd like to sh tell you that, you know, we're quite aware and tuned into overarching trends and factors in the uh, healthcare space. And, you know, it's um, AEC's experience in color, color stability, and color matching lines up perfectly with the needs of healthcare. Uh, medical device OEMs takes their colors very seriously. Uh, uh, this colors and their stability are synonymous with their brands, and there can be no ambiguity or degradation in their in their color. Of course, this isn't just unique to um, medical applications, as anyone's ever heard the uh, the term John Deere uh, green. So, uh, color also brings about a psychological effect, and I'd like to give a plug to Haley's 2022 Color Trends, Star of Senses, and Fearless Futures. And while I can't do it justice, just to say that uh, AEC and Americam are very uh, conscious of color and its effects uh, in, in the beholder's uh, eye and mind. And further, just a more specific example is that uh, healthcare providers and, and healthcare facilities and architects are mindful of soothing, using soothing colors for patients for um, if and where there's agitation, such as in a hype, um, crowded um, uh, MRI suite. And uh, Disney and Philips have inked a deal where they're actually using uh, Disney characters and imagery to help soothe uh, agitated pediatric patients whose wiggling around might act adversely affect the study. And lastly, uh, safety is a big concern in uh, when it comes to color, and color codes are implemented for safety. Uh, avoiding cross-contamination and other factors. Uh, an example would be gas tubing uh, in a hospital setting. You know, yellow is for air, white is for suction, and green is for oxygen, and for obvious reasons, uh, you wouldn't want to um, mix those up. And the word I was searching for there in the MRI suite was uh, claustrophobia. So other trends we're seeing in the age of uh, uh, COVID is aggressive and frequent uh, disinfection. We've seen clinicians and, and uh, environmental service uh, personnel grabbing just about anything they can get their hands on to uh, aggressively and frequently disinfect these uh, hospital uh, devices, uh, as well as a, a big uh, spike in uh, UV robots, UVC robots, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail. And I think we can agree that uh, patient emissions have spiked during COVID-19 and more patients, and especially the associated chaos that comes with that, uh, means more use and misuse of, of medical equipment. Um, so in my uh, ideal world, uh, again, being your trusted collaborative partner, we, we look at the big picture. We strive for an improved development cycle where the device OEMs makes material selections with our recommendation, but also with the chemical resistance and UV stabilization in mind. So the, the EPA regulates the disinfectants and the FDA regulates the device OEMs, but one cannot assume, even while there's similarities, that those two agencies aren't, aren't necessarily talking to each other. So it's up to us to, to, to look at the whole picture here. And I like this slide because it puts the clinical user and really the patient at the end of the day in, in the middle there. So I want to say that uh, chemical resistance is very important because it prevents cracking and crazing and cracks are bad because that's where harmful pathogens can start to live and that can lead to very expensive and uh, dangerous and even deadly healthcare associated infections. So by selecting the materials that can withstand harsh disinfectants and even sterilization, uh, devices will last longer, risk will go down 
uh, and costs will go down. But also, it's really important, and and you know, again, to the title of this this webinar, aesthetics and color stability are important too. Why? Because looks count. Clinicians and patients uh, demand that uh, devices be clean and, and disinfected, but also look clean. And I can tell you, as as a patient, uh, this was before COVID, but I was hospitalized, and I had a I was given a survey upon discharge, and what they did well, I marked, and what they didn't well, I also marked candidly, and I got a call from the hospital administrator within 24 hours saying, hey, you know, our bad, what can we do better? And the thing is, it's not just to, you know, be a good care provider or get more likes on social media. They actually stand to lose real money. Uh, they can get dinged on their reimbursement if they get enough um, negative scores in the survey, and they also can um, can and will get dinged on reimbursement if the uh, HAIs uh, uh, spike. So I'm going to give it back to Raf. Hey, thanks, Bill. Um, okay, so when we're talking about chemical resistance, primarily we're talking about housings that are in hospital settings that see regular scheduled cleanings. Um, so those are listed to the left, patient monitoring, IV pumps. I think everybody out there knows those, uh, diagnostic equipment. And with those, there's added requirements. So typically OEMs want chemical stability at with UV and, chemi and chemical. Um, V0, 1.5 millimeters or three millimeters, good impact properties, and they want a material that's gonna mold very accurately. So those are our requirements, and we're gonna be talking about that later. Um, in regards to chemical testing, uh, we use a standard procedure where we're taking a type one tensile bar, we're clamping it down on the ends, adding a 1% radius or 2%. There's also a couple smaller ones, but we typically do 1%, 2% strain. And we're gonna saturate the cotton ball, put it in the center of the tensile bar for 24 to 72 hours. There's the saturation test. And there's also a wipe test, um, depending on what the application calls for. And then after exposure time, we're gonna take that tensile bar out and we're gonna do tensile, tensile strength testing, tensile elongation, and also impact testing. Um, on the next slide, real quick, we're gonna talk about something that probably everybody knows and uh, is what we're using today. So today we're using FRPCABS. There's been some transition to PC, PET, and PC, PBT, um, combination of both. Um, we have all those solutions in-house. Um, typically PCABS, you're gonna have 65% polycarbonate, 35% ABS. The alloys are great because they balance each other. PC is gonna give um, good flammability and impact values, which ABS lacks. And then the ABS comes in to increase the overall chemical resistance that polycarbonate lacks. And you can see here about 40 to 50 different cleaning agents and chemicals that are out there where we did that chemical testing and we give it a grading system. So excellence gonna be uh, in green, um, it goes all the way down to failure. Um, typically green's gonna be any anytime we have 90% or more tensile retention, um, failures, are gonna be anything 60 or below. Um, and primarily we wanna see things stay above 80% for the most part. So this is where we're at today. Typical pricing in for, for pre-colored PCABS is gonna be 250 to 350 a pound on large volumes and goes on up obviously this, if, the, if the volumes decrease, releases decrease to customer. So when we look on going forward on the next slide, we're gonna look at um, a list of materials, you see them listed there, uh, PCABS being on the left, we got peak on the right, and this is just a quick graph of chemical resistance. As you go to the right, your chemical resistance is gonna increase, and most of the time your pricing increases as well. So we have a whole cookbook of alloys, amorphous and crystalline. Crystalline materials are typically gonna give you really great uh, flammability uh, properties and chemical resistance but the amorphous materials like PC and ABS, they're gonna give you the ability to mold very accurate. So when you're molding a, a large part, it gives you dimensional stability. Um, so we have a, a ton of solutions, PC, PET, PC, PBT. Uh, what's really great and interesting about in the amorphous side is PSU or UDEL and PPSU, RADEL, and even Altem, polyethylamide, they're all transparent. And so they're easily colorable, they have really good inherent flame resistance properties and they have great uh, chemical resistance 
the price is just significantly higher. So once the OEMs are ready to spend more for their per pound for their housing, we're ready with a, a series of alloys. And this is a quick alloy. This is a polyether iamond alloy. Trade name is going to be Altem, where we created this formulation. Easily colorable, molds great. It's going to have great inherent flame resistant properties, and that's great because if you don't have to add FR packages, you're going to retain the, the, the mechanical properties. And we tested it to a whole series of chemicals, and this is just four or five, and there was no effect at 1% or 2% strain. So on the next slide, this is a case study. Um, this is a situation where I'm very proud of how we work. A customer comes to us, gives us a series of requirements. Um, in this case, they wanted, they're going to sterilize via steam autoclave, which that pinpoints you into three or four polymers, right? We're going to be in the Peak family, Radel or Udel, PPSU or PSU. And then they're also going to do low temperature hydrogen peroxide. So, and they want color stability. Um, the, creep, the creep actually came later. That requirement was later, and we'll talk about that. But basically, you have a orthopedic sterilization tray that sees multiple sterilization cycles. We use a shotgun approach where we basically tell them, hey, these are the polymers that will work for your application. We do the color matches very quickly in all those polymers, send them color chip coupons and tensile bars, and then have them do the, the autoclave and the ster sterilization testing and see what they, they find. So. In this case, Altem uh, lost impact with the steam autoclave cycle. Radel had a color shift and embrittlement problems with that low temperature hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the peak or PAEK Avispire, which is in the peak family, um, was in, was uh, survived both sterilization process. So now we have the polymer set. You can see that the part in red there on top. But then later on, the OEM wanted a, a stiffer product. So when you're talking stiffness, you're going to talk glass fiber. So we added 30% glass fiber um, to the product, and then it went to the molder, and then we followed it to the molder, provided some technical, some molding assistance, and helped them to bury the glass. And you can see that product right there. And if you saw it up close, you can see that there's no swirling or any uh, aesthetic issues with the part because we were able to bury the glass and give them a good aesthetic part. So uh, important to note that all the amorphous materials pretty much have the same shrinkage. So if you're, you don't know if PC or PSU or PP, PPSU will work, they all have pretty much the same shrinkage value. So you can build your tool and run all those in the same tool. Um, this Glassville Peak has a shrinkage around two thousandths. So it was a little, a little low compared to unfilled amorphous materials, but they were able to make it work. On the next slide, uh, Bill is going to discuss the spalding classification. Yeah, it's, thanks, Raf. Um, that, that was fantastic. Uh, we're, we're lucky to have your application uh, expertise. And um, you know, I I think and I and I hope you guys know us as um, you know technical providers, especially engineer materials providers. But you know, we also bring you know a holistic, big picture. Uh, perspective here, and there's um, yeah, it's quite an alphabet soup, right? EPA, uh, IFU, FDA, CDC, and um, you know what, what I want to get to here is the the uh, the, the criticality categories uh, as as referenced by Dr. Spalding. Thank God for him because he made it so simple. You can find this on the uh, the uh, CDC website, and you might note that uh, cleaner or cleaning or cleaning agent isn't even on here. So you know, yes. Uh, uh, clinicians would you know use soap and water even isopropyl alcohol but that doesn't even scratch the surface of disinfection and i think what we're saying here what raf was saying is that it's it's a tough environment for for materials to survive in in healthcare with all these uh, chemicals and sterilization going on so firstly is the non-critical uh, category this is any external device type uh, such as a stethoscope on your chest a ultrasound scanner uh, on your on your neck or your belly, and this requires a low-level disinfectant, and these include bleach, hydrogen peroxide, quaternary ammonium, etc. And again, during the pandemic, people were grabbing this stuff from Walgreens and and um, Home Depot, at least from you know for bleach and hydrogen peroxide. Uh, however, uh, most uh, clinical customers would get these through uh, source these through distribution from some of the big guys like. Uh, PDI, Clorox, Diversi, and, uh, and Metrex. 
Uh, next comes a semi-critical category, and this is going to be an internal uh, device type that gets in touch with non-intact non skin or a mucous membrane. That could be even a laryngoscope, endoscope, transesophageal probe uh, in, in cardiac ultrasound, and requires a high-level uh, disinfectant. And, and anyone's ever had the unique joy of a colonoscopy, you'd be happy to know that the scope uh, bathed in, in, in a glycol bath uh, overnight. And this is uh, not to meant to be an exhaustive list of all the chemicals and devices. This is just an example to try to put it in a, a, a nice table here. Lastly, and most critically, pun intended, is the sterile, which is going to uh, operate in a sterile field, such as a, um, a surgical uh, device or biopsy device, or even uh, image-guided surgery. And that's going to require sterilization, and that could be you know, ambient tem temperature gas, ethylene oxide, uh, autoclave uh, steam, which uh, Raf just mentioned, or gamma and E-beam uh, radiation, which uh, as a teaser, um, we have a, another case study at the end of the talk uh, that talks about that. So uh, the other side of our coin, uh, the, uh, the chemical resistance being one and UV stabilization, uh, UV exposure can negatively affect uh, these, these clear tubing, right? And obviously sources of UV could be the sun, fluorescent tube lamps that are very common in, uh, in healthcare settings. I know that's changing over time as, as sites and architects start dialing in more uh, LED lights, but until that happens, uh, it's still a thing. The, the, well, our benefit through our using UV additives uh, is the stabilization of the device for the appearance, for the uh, mechanical stability, and, and overall the uh, life of the material. And most commonly, these are uh, clear tubing for intravenous, IV tube setting, uh, and also uh, catheters. So back to my old friend, the, uh, the UVC robot. So we've seen a real uh, proliferation of these. And, you know, it's worth noting that, you know, before AEC, I was working for an infection prevention company that made a significant uh, acquisition of a, a UVC robot technology company. And that wavelength is w well known to uh, kill harmful pathogens such as C. diff, MRSA, and all those bugs that you can't even pronounce that you don't want to get uh, in, in the healthcare uh, setting. And just back to the you know overarching chat trends, I wanted to point out that another thing we've seen is that clinicians and, and environmental services folks, what used to be reserved solely for uh, what's called terminal disinfection, that means in between patients after discharge or in between cases in an OR, they are now using those agents such as bleach and hydrogen peroxide almost on a daily uh, and, and an hourly method. Uh, further, we've seen uh, what I'll call a, uh, a belt and suspenders approach where they'll wipe, use the wipes and sprays to wipe down the medical equipment. Uh, what's pictured here looks to be a, a cardiac catheterization lab. So they'll wipe it down and then put the robot in and irradiate the room with uh, UVC radiation. So between the, the caustic materials, the chemicals, and the radiation, um, you know, what, are, what do materials need in them and how can AEC help? with our additives to uh, help them last. And now back to Raf. Hey, thanks, Bill. So um, when we talk about uh, overall appearance, a lot of OEMs have multiple molders, molding different components for one assembly. And we know that everything's gonna affect overall color of that finished molded part. Uh, processing has a big thing to do with it. Different temperatures, different types of screws, different holding times, even cooling time is gonna give you a different shade. And I, and nominal wall, nominal wall, obviously nominal walls being the biggest one, and different nominal wall as well. We like to work with OEMs and their molders to get to the molder, get their part, and if they're seeing a difference in color when that assembly goes together, we can help to tweak the color at each molder. So when they finish molding their part with their validated process, it goes to the OEM, and it all looks the same. And this side, slide right here uh, talks about overall shelf life. Most OEMs, mainly in the surgical tool, laparoscopic instrument world, they want their instrument to sit on the shelf, see indirect, direct UV, and UV uh, uh, B from the cool white fluorescent lighting. And they want their part, their housings, to sit there for two years and have no color shift. Um, so we've gone we've gotten really good at doing that over the years. And on the left here, you're going to see uh, on the uh, two sets of chips. Um, our formulations on the left, 
and this is an FR ABS, and the current material on the right. So we have in-house Xenon arc testers, and we can work with you out there. Um, if you want to do accelerated testing, see what your color is going to look like in one, two, three, five, 10, 20 years, we can do that. And here we basically, I took the current material, molded chips, and I did basically the same color match, UV stabilized it, and did a 120 hour test. Every 50 hours, we pulled it out, every like 20 to 40, 50 hours. We pulled the color chips out, hit it with spectrometer, and gave them readings to show the color shift. This one, after 120 hours, was uh, pretty easy to see. Um, you can see how UV, UV stabilizing ABS, how well it does work. Uh, to, and that's representing a year worth of UV exposure. On the right hand side, a little harder to see. This is an FRPC ABS. Our formulations on the right, current formulations on the left. Uh, this is a three year test, 250 hours. We pulled chips every 50 hours, did measurements. And it's a little bit harder to tell, but you can see on the left, there was a, a color shift into the yellow spectrum that showed uh, degradation. And so we showed the OEM that pretty much with no cost increase, um, if anything, we lower costs, that we can give you the same color and keep that color for a long time. On the next slide, uh, this is Bill. Bill's gonna talk about this polypropylene application, which polypropylene has very limited UV resistance. Bill? Yeah, th thanks, Raph. This is, um, as you can probably guess, this is a, a urinary catheter from a medical device OEM in Western Europe. And the problem statement was that the clear material would uh, change color with uh, UV exposure and also have a color and degradation, a material degradation uh, through the E-beam gamma sterilization. So after this device is manufactured, it gets sterilized, packaged, uh, and sent to the consumer. Uh, I say consumer versus uh, hospital because this uh, is actually positioned for uh, what I'll call, you know, lifestyle where, um, you know, an everyday uh, person who has a little bit of trouble voiding their bladder can use this, uh, male or female. So uh, this wouldn't necessarily go to the hospital. Um, so, yeah, again, like uh, Raf says, a pro polypropylene, and it uh, needs to expand during sterilization because there's liquid inside the catheter and needs to expand and go back to its original shape without uh, problems, and our, our additives uh, are, are uh, helpful for that, as well as the stabilization to fight against negative effects from the uh, UV. Back to you, Rob. Hey, okay, thanks a lot, Bill. So in closing, thanks again for your time. We wanna quickly tell you that we have a full staff of very seasoned and technical salespeople and distribution partners as well, which we support. Um, we are global. We have multiple ISO 1345 facilities. So we're global in the European market, Asia, and United States. And we're proud to state that we can make any formulation um, that is in our Color RX line, which is our biocompatible line of polymers and fillers and additives and pigments. Any formulation we can make in the United States, we can make in Shuzo, Denmark. So that's something we're very proud of. Um, overall, all of our products are Rojas Reach compliant. Uh, we are unbiased in material selection, uh, and we pick the right solution for the application. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions or you have an application you're working on, uh, please reach out. And we're definitely very intentional to help out and help out quickly. Thank you so much. Thanks, Raph. Yeah, and just you know, just to reiterate, you know, we have a solid working knowledge of. Uh, regulatory standards we we get the you know the regulatory rigors of uh demanding medical applications uh you know we also offer biocompatibility testing to help you know oems and designers get a get a leg up in the product development cycle and uh lastly we we're very proud of the huge investment we made in a clean compounding facility um to to um you know further um emphasize our our doubling down our our, our, our pure commitment to uh medical device applications um, and now it's time for me to, to remind you that part three of our color and retention series is uh, coming up. Uh, I believe the, the date is May 15th. This would be a building and construction component. And uh, Haley will keep those uh, notices coming on the uh, social media and elsewhere. And if I, if I got that right, great. If not, you can correct me uh, 
Haley, and um, back to you. Thank you, Bill and Raphael. That was really educational and definitely applicable to today's healthcare environment. We'll now be moving into our Q&A portion of the webinar. I'll be reading off the questions that have been submitted and pass them on to our panelists for answering. I do want to jump in here quickly, though, since we are at our 30-minute time limit, but we have lots of questions that have come in during the presentation um, that, if time permits, please stay on the webinar. We'll answer questions over the next 15 minutes. That'll take us to 9.45 Eastern Standard Time. Um, but I'd like to briefly mention here how you can ask us further questions after the webinar is over. If you have any other questions, you can certainly connect with our panelists on LinkedIn, but you can also go to the American website and ask us questions through the instructions on this slide that you see here. If you go to americam.com and click contact us, then choose the contact form that states I have a general corporate inquiry and choose the option to send the contact form to marketing. I'll be receiving all of these questions directly and follow up with our panelists as soon as possible. You can also take a screenshot of these directions, but we'll be sending out a follow-up email with the directions and a link to our contact page. So let's jump into these questions here. Our first one is, uh, Santa Claus is not on your chemical testing list. Have you guys tested that before? I thought it was. I don't know if we can go back in the slides, but um, Santa Claus is, is one of the things we do test. I don't know, Haley, can, I don't know if we can go back in the presentation um, or I can just say yes, but the answer is yes. Well, well, Santa Claus is actually a generic term. There's Super Santa Claus, there's Santa Claus uh, HB, there's Santa Claus Plus. How do I know this? Because I used to work for that company. So I think we need a little bit more details. And what's important is uh, what chemistry is in there and what additives are in the um, in the wipe or the spray. But let's uh, let's take that down and um, come back with some more detail as to which exact um, you know wipe or spray we're we're talking about there and. Uh, I still have some friends over there, so I can certainly facilitate any any testing or more, um, you know, specific details as far as the wipe or the chemistry. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, the next question here is, you mentioned UVC on a couple of slides. Do you have a test method for UVC stability, and do you have products to improve UVC stability? I have, I have some like high level thoughts on that raft, but you, you're probably more specific. So I'll give that one to you and then maybe I'll chime in at the, after you're done. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think we can test for it. We can obviously, um, we have some applications that we're working in that, working for the UVC and the robotics industry. Um, can't say, give too many details, but primarily UVC is uh, a set wavelength. I believe it's, I forget right right now, right below UVB, it's, uh, I don't know, 100 to 200 nanometers. Um, that's a, a rough guess, but I think that's accurate. And so we can easily test, you guys have, if you have an application and you want it to last one, two, three, four or five years with minimal color shift or check if the polymer is not gonna have any mechanical failures, uh, we certainly could do color matching and then put the chips in the xenon arc, do the uh, uh, accelerated testing, and show you what happens. That's very fairly easy, and it's just a setting in the equipment. So, Bill, so that's about all I can really say about UVC. You got anything? Yeah, no, I lo I, lo I love the questions, and you know that's that's the thing. I'm not I'm not surprised by that question at all because you know as I tried to explain, there's there's a lot of data as far as the efficacy of the of the pathogen kills from from the radiation but not a lot on the effects on the engineered materials so um you know we could talk about a, a test test lab or a test jig um you know get a lamp source and maybe a you know a crate kind of thing you don't want to have any other factors involved and i know some people are doing that but um you know we'd have to work collaboratively to to set up that that test environment Great, so our next question is, does the Spalding classification have recommendations for single-use disposables in a medical environment? Uh, depends on the application, meaning if it's just for, um, you know, external uh, 
applications, then it would just need to be cleaned. It would need to be sterilized. Um, if it's going to touch uh, a mucous membrane or a, a non-intact skin, then it would need low-level disinfection, such as bleach or uh, hydrogen peroxide, et cetera. And then lastly, if it's if it's going to go into a sterile field, uh, it would it would need to be sterilized. So it depends it depends on the application. If I if I understood the question correctly, if if yep. it's single use, uh, sorry. Nope, that's okay. Go ahead, Bill. I'll just say if it's if it's single use, it would need those 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 disinfection or sterilants, and then obviously it gets gets thrown away. Okay, moving to the next question. If PC, ABS, and PC ABS have weak chemical resistance, why are they so commonly specified for medical device housing? Is it low cost? Is it habit? Is it lack of awareness? Yeah, Bill, do you want me to take this or do you want it? No, no, please do. Okay, all right. So I think primarily uh, polycarbonate ABS are pretty old polymers. They're, they're amorphous. It's really easy to design with, piece, with amorphous materials, uh, uh, especially PC and ABS. They mold very flat, very accurately, um, predictable shrinkage. So if you had a, uh, a part and it had a bunch of uh, cutouts and a bunch of geometries and you had like, if you're holding 10 criticals, you're holding a molder to 10, you know, six or 10 criticals, um, it's a lot easier to do that in PC ABS. And also it's cost. I mean, I think as the hospital increased these, these harsh chemicals and cleaning agents, which they weren't using uh, years ago, I mean, OEMs give, OEMs give hospitals a list of cleaners that are approved. And now hospitals are using harsher and harsher chemicals. So I think it's been in the last 15 years that OEMs have just been, well, this housing's cracked. It cracked within two to five years. We'll just replace it, and um, they don't. I'm not sure if they're really capturing all that cost, um, but primarily it's cost. It's it, it's you know when you can get if you have a large housing application with you know there's OEMs that have very big application and it's 700,000 pounds, a million pounds a year. They they rather pay two dollars and twenty cents a pound than pay five dollars a pound, and that's kind of where we're at. Once they once that matures and maybe they can increase pricing, we can start talking about housing materials that are six, seven, eight, nine dollars a pound that you know aren't gonna aren't gonna break uh, because of micro cracks with self tapping screws and bosses where chemicals you know just sit there and pull up, wick in, yeah, good. and create cracks. Yeah, good point, Raph. It's to me, it's like a total cost of ownership thing. I mean, you can get materials that are cheaper today, and then devices fail sooner than they they ought to. Um, you know, and and Haley, I'm conscious of the time, but I just want to say that in my humble experience, um, I've seen uh, OEM designers dialing in the the testing and the specification of the disinfectants earlier in the product development cycle, which is which is very which is very smart. Um, it's um, it's probably worth noting that you know the device OEMs are beholden to the FDA, the disinfectants are beholden to the EPA, but the the FDA uh, requires that the device OEM have something called an IFU or instruction for use, where they where they say exactly how the device will be cleaned, disinfectant, or sterilized. And the the, the evolution of those notes or uh, manuals have gone from soap and water, yeah, clean it, to you know, it's very specific um, um, chemistries and disinfectants, and those have been tested. And you know, there, there's good, perhaps, debate on what how to test. But uh, you know, I'm a fan of the following test, which is uh, ASTM D638 tensile testing, and ASTM D543, which is a uh, environmental stress crack testing and i didn't make those up i work with smarter people than me in my last position at an infection prevention company so those those i hope uh, you find helpful and i hope we uh helped you out with our question our, our answers here because there's there's so much to talk about and it's uh, too much to cram into a half hour so uh, appreciate your attentions and your awesome question 
Yes, we'll definitely be doing some follow-up from a lot of the questions coming in here. We will take another though. Um, the next question is, what do you think about the adaptability of biomaterials and recycled materials in medical devices due to their inferior resistance to several chemicals and sterilization? Well, I, I think if you're, if you're not looking at the housing and you're looking at internal components, I'm sure there's a lot of good places for those uh, renewable materials. I mean, renewable materials are, they're really getting, um, they're coming up with some new things that are very interesting. Um, but I would say if it was inside the housing, um, some support part, um, it'd be, it would be great. It's great to, to have recycled materials like um, PET, you know, um, very interesting to do testing on a PC, PET with post-consumed PET. Um, that'd be interesting. I, we, I haven't done any, any work in that area, but it, it'd be very interesting, good for the environment too. So I would support the research. I just don't have much to say about it, I guess, is um, hands-on personal experience. Yeah, and my two cents is, you know, and I'm not trying to twist the question, but when I when I hear, um, and I'm not a renewability, renewability or sustainability expert by any means, but when I hear biomaterials, I'm thinking, you know, in, in the body and, you know, that would require, you know, that would be a single use device typically and require sterilization, uh, even as far as, you know, bioabsorbable or plantable, which you know, we're not really uh, doing. So I'd say, uh, yeah, there's requires sterilization for, for single use. Yeah, and I think bio, they're probably meaning um, polymers made from corn, now that I think about mm -hmm. it. So they're probably yeah. talking about PGA and a lot of those polymers that are made from corn or castor bean oil. Um, so those are interesting. I mean, ca the amorphous, a lot of amor uh, nylon 11, excuse me, um, I believe that's the one. It's either nylon 11 or nylon 12. I always mix it up. Um, they use castor beans to, in that, to make that product. Um, so that's interesting because it has a green aspect, but you got to add so much FR to that to um, make it a B0 product that once you make a B0 nylon 11 or 12, I think it's 11, um, the properties go down so far, it, 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 it's, it behooves you to use it. So, which mo a lot of nylons, you need to add 20, 30% FR to make it a B0 product, but that especially, you need a tremendous amount of rock to uh, make that B0. So um, I think making those bio materials B0 would be, uh, would be a challenge. Yeah, the good news is we have smart people in our R&D group who would be better poised to um, take those sort of challenges. And I appreciate the question and keeping us on our toes. I mean, Haley, I don't know if you want to point to the recent, um, you know, uh, accolade we got that we post probably on our website for sustainability or that might tie in, but a um, good excuse to give it a plug perhaps. Yeah, and we've actually worked with a lot of biomaterials and recycled materials just in different applications, not specifically medical devices, but we do have experience with biomaterials in things like automotive interiors, packaging, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we can certainly follow up there and see what we can do in terms of a, a medical application that way. Um, but our next question here is, have you manufactured products for COVID related end applications such as ventilators, thermometers, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually, before COVID, we were already uh, quite busy with uh, thermometers, uh, respiratory products, uh, surgical products, and also um, what I would call um, respirators, which is, you know, uh, a, a mask that has uh, extra protection versus, um, you know, airborne airborne pathogens. So um, <laughs> you can guess the, the name of the OEM, which I shall not reveal, but uh, yeah, I mean, ventilators, um, all those things, especially for critical care, right? So, you know, God forbid you you get tested positive or you get hospitalized and then you're intubated. So any and all things that happen in, uh, you know, acute, what I call acute care, you know, ICU, um, infusion pumps. Um, uh, yeah, so the answer, short answer is yes, absolutely. But also keeping a, a keen eye on what uh, clinicians are gonna use to, you know, forget the expression, you know, disinfect the living crap out of the uh, devices as we go.
Okay, thanks there, Bill. Um, so we, it is 945, so we're gonna wrap up here. So that wraps up our Q&A portion of the webinar. So I'd like to thank our panelists for their time today, and I'd like to thank our attendees for joining AmeriChem in this important discussion about color and appearance retention in engineered compounds for healthcare applications. So thank you again for attending our webinar today, and that concludes our presentation. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Haley. Thanks.